Hi there, welcome to IndyCar. On the glorious 12th of August, uh, well, glorious, unless you happen to be a grouse, I suppose. Anyway, welcome to today's programme. And uh, in, in today's show, I wanted to look at two topics which caught my eye this morning. Um, the first one, I think we've probably all seen, Neil Oliver, uh, the, the hairy historian who, um, who wears his unionism as a badge when he's uh, rewriting the history of Scotland. Neil Oliver was... Uh, quoted in the newspapers and the press today as claiming that uh, he's been victimised, that his uh, human rights have been breached by being forced to wear a mask during a pandemic. Now, this is one of the, the more typical sort of responses you would expect from a sort of free market libertarian mind like that of Mr. Oliver. He is um, well known for his views, but uh, less or known for his views on things like human rights. But he's claiming that um, his human rights have been violated because he's been asked by his own government here in Scotland uh, to wear a mask because of a public health emergency and that this is uh, bullying him in some way into doing something he didn't want to do. But basically what he's saying here is that he thinks <coughs> it's his right to go around without a mask infecting other people with COVID-19 because it's his personal choice to do this, like it would be his personal choice to smoke or drink or take drugs. But it doesn't make it right. It doesn't mean what he's saying is actually good for him or good for anybody else. So Mr. Oliver, again, is just showing his, his true nature here, which is pretty unpleasant, that he is so selfish and self-centered that he thinks he is the person who is a victim in the pandemic simply because he has to wear a face covering to help protect other people from getting the pandemic. Now, there are very, um, very few people, thankfully, who hold his view. Yes, masks are a nuisance, and yes, nobody really likes wearing them. I don't like wearing them, but I accept the fact that it's necessary because it protects other people, which is fine, you would expect to protect other people. However, Mr. Oliver obviously doesn't think this. Uh, he, he is um, invoking the, the Dunkirk spirit, you know, that um, you should have the right to do whatever you like and government shouldn't interfere. So he is a libertarian. He is a, a, a man who believes that government shouldn't interfere in people's health, that they shouldn't act to prevent large-scale deaths uh, and destruction just so that he doesn't have the inconvenience of wearing a mask. So if he had a shred of credibility left uh, in the popular press in Scotland and amongst Scottish people in general, it certainly disappeared with these comments. And the second item on today's programme is a little bit more complicated. Um, <clears throat> many people have gone on at great length about the legality and the illegality of holding referendums on independence, but there's not been much actual work done, that we've seen anyway, um, which tells us what the real legal position is in international law. But such a paper does exist. It was published by the Institute for the Rule of Law, which is a think tank which consists of the top legal minds in the UK. And this report uh, didn't come from Scotland, and at the time of its publication, it was suppressed. It was prevented from being published and widely uh, known about. And it was basically censored in this way because it contained, opin well, not, not opinions, legal views on what should and shouldn't occur uh, with regards to Scottish independence. And it made several very interesting points uh, about the legality of holding a referendum, the legality of secession, and uh, moreover the interesting uh, political and economic benefits of Scotland leaving the Union. So because it was so uh, positive about independence, it had to be suppressed uh, by the British state. Nobody uh, in the British state wanted the Scots or anyone else knowing that Scotland would do better outside of the United Kingdom. One of the first things it, uh, it looks at is the issue of the Scottish government holding a referendum without the participation of the United Kingdom. And the legal opinion on this was that it would have to be decided by the UK Supreme Court. But, and this was a gigantic but, the Supreme Court was unlikely to ever rule on it because to, to create a law in the United Kingdom which bans an elected government from 
uh, allowing participatory democracy to take place would put the United Kingdom in a very, very dark place internationally. It would be the denial of international law, which means that all countries, all peoples have the right to self-determination under the United Nations Charter. And of course, the United Nations is a body which the UK is a top member of. And for them to get their own court to decide that the democratic uh, will of an entire country uh, and its government was illegal would be a colossal step over a line which says that uh, the United Kingdom is no longer entitled to be a member of the United Nations because it no longer respects the rule of international law. So the two authors, the, um, the legal experts who wrote this paper, believed that the United Kingdom could not uh, force its own High Court, it's the Supreme Court, to make such a ruling, and that no judges um, or other law officers of the United Kingdom would ever want to come near making a decision like that, because it would basically destroy Britain's credibility as a democracy. So that was the first thing. The second thing was that they also believed, uh, because of their interpretation of international and national law, that Scotland is perfectly entitled to hold a referendum on independence <coughs> without anybody's permission. Uh, and an advisory referendum such as this would have no effect, really, in terms of independence because it does not contain any legally binding uh, clauses which make governments act. It is purely advisory. However, for a government not to act on such a result, let's say there was a yes vote, would again be the United Kingdom denying uh, the right to self-determination and again stepping over this international legal boundary uh, and becoming a pariah state which is no longer a democracy. So again, they believe, uh, and I think rightly so in this case, that if we have a referendum and we do vote, yes to independence as a majority, that the United Kingdom would be forced to accept it because to do otherwise would be to basically get itself kicked out of the UN because it would no longer be a free democracy. It would become a totalitarian state and would end up on a blacklist of states. It would not be respected by other governments. The, nobody would trade with the United Kingdom. There would be sanctions placed on the United Kingdom by other countries because other countries know that Scotland is a peaceful nation uh, and that it's law-abiding and that it believes in democracy. And for England, because that's who it would be in this case causing this problem, uh, to ban democracy in Scotland on this scale would effectively be breaking international law. So that's the... The next thing. So having a referendum is not illegal in any way. In fact, it's, it's a perfect exercise of the right to self-determination, which is a legal, legal right under international law, which is accepted by the United Nations. But if the United Kingdom, let's say that we have a referendum and we vote yes in a majority, and the United Kingdom still refuses to recognise Scotland as an independent state, the Scottish Government would be entitled to act as an independent state. The authors acknowledge that um, Scotland's Parliament only actually lacks one power uh, that all international states have, uh, and it's the one power that Scotland hasn't been able to exert so far. Uh, because it is part of the United Kingdom, and that is the right to negotiate its own trade deals with other countries. However, what they are suggesting is that if the British state were to continue to deny Scotland its independence, even after the result of a legally uh, held advisory referendum, then the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Government would be within their rights to negotiate themselves a deal with the European Union without any uh, reference to the United Kingdom whatsoever. And the rest of the, uh, the countries of the United Nations and those in the European Union particularly would be only too happy to sign a new agreement with Scotland that would allow us to restart trade almost immediately. Although we wouldn't be able to rejoin the European Union quite as fast as that, certainly signing um, a temporary trade deal with the, United, uh, with the European Union would be perfectly feasible. Now what this says is that under the current laws of 
the United Kingdom and under international law, Scotland would be regarded in that circumstance as an independent state because having been denied its democratic right to self-determination by the government in London, Scotland would be acting within its rights in international law to ignore all of the rules of the United Kingdom and to go its own way and to start behaving as an independent country should and start to trade with other countries. Now, in this report, Scotland uh, and its position in the UK and its separation from the UK uh, has been compared to the Slovak Republic and the way uh, they had their so-called velvet divorce. And in the Slovak case, um, although they did a lot of trade whilst they were in the side, if you like, the Iron Curtain, while they were still part uh, of the Eastern Bloc of the Soviet Union, they very quickly realised that they could substitute their exports, which they would lose by, uh, by breaking away from the Bloc, uh, by simply substituting the trade that they had with the Eastern Bloc, by trading more with countries like Germany. And very quickly, within a couple of years, the trade that had been lost through their separation from uh, the, the former Cold War bloc had quickly been replaced by an even higher level of trade with Germany. Now, in Scotland's case, and these figures are obviously argued about because we don't have accurate figures, according to the only figures we have, which are these so-called GERS figures, Scotland currently exports approximately 18% uh, to America and other non-EU countries, approximately 20%-ish to the European Union. And according to the GERS figures, the rest, the 60-odd percent, is going to England, or the rest of the UK, as they like to be called. So we, we would be told by the, the United Kingdom that if we go alone, they'll, that we will lose this 60% of our exports to the UK. However, that's not the whole story, because by simply increasing the amount of trade with the European Union and increasing the amount of trade with non-EU countries, including the United States, we could easily rebalance the economy very quickly and probably end up more wealthy than we were when we were trading with the rest of the UK. And the only area of the United Kingdom which would come off worse would be the rest of the United Kingdom, because they would lose all of these um, valuable imports which they rely upon coming from Scotland, uh, and they would lose them forever by simply being spiteful, cutting off their noses despite their faces. Now, there was one other very interesting point that was made, and this one I think is worth remembering. Many of us have criticised the SNP for not having a plan B, but there is a plan B, and the plan B is very interesting, because if we uh, imagine for a moment that the United Kingdom refuses to let us have a referendum, legislates in its uh, Supreme Court to make such a referendum illegal uh, and prevents us from ever having a vote, then Scotland, in that situation, under international law, can invoke its right to self-determination and secede completely. It can do that without any permission whatsoever and it could go straight to the European Union and sign a trade deal. It could go straight to the United States and sign an even bigger trade deal with them. There is nothing uh, actually in international law which would prevent Scotland from simply leaving the United Kingdom because all of its democratic rights have basically been banned by the United Kingdom. If the United Kingdom was stupid enough to do that, as I said, it would become a pariah state. Nobody would trade with them. Trade sanctions uh, would be applied to the United Kingdom. There would be, you know, bans on things. There would be blockades. British goods would not be welcome anywhere uh, in the countries of the United Nations or in the EU. England itself would end up isolated completely, even more than it is with Brexit at the moment. So the stakes are very, very high here, but the way that the legal position is set out which in this document, which is prepared by some of the top legal minds in England, who are responsible for upholding the rule of law, that's what this think tank is all about, the rule of law, both national and international, say that for the UK to take these kinds of actions to prevent Scotland from exerting and from using its right to self-determination, 
would result in the UK breaking international law in the worst possible way at the worst possible time for the United Kingdom when it is already isolated itself when it's suffering food shortages driver shortages where it cannot trade properly because of the trade barriers it's erected itself at that moment to do something as stupid as to deny the Scots the right to vote on whether they want to remain in the UK and whether they want to continue with Brexit or not would be suicide for the British state. And that's why this particular document has never been allowed to be published. I think it's even more incendiary than the Macron report on uh, Scotland's oil wealth. The Macron report was another one of these ones which was basically hidden away in a file so nobody could ever see it. But this document is an academic piece by legal experts and it outlines exactly what Scotland can do in all three cases. It can hold a referendum anytime it likes, with or without the UK's permission. In the event of a yes vote, it can demand that the UK recognises it. If it doesn't, then Scotland can then start its own foreign trade and act as an independent state anyway, ignoring all British, in inverted commas, laws. And in the, the final analysis, in the, in the worst case scenario, if the United Kingdom denies Scots any right at all to have any kind of vote on their own uh, self-determination, then in that particular case, Scotland can secede immediately and it can instantly sign trade deals with anybody else it likes and be instantly recognised by the rest of the world. And that is the legal position. And if the if Boris Johnson or anyone else in the Tory party is stupid enough to try to get their so-called Supreme Court to make voting illegal in Scotland, then they will reap the result, which would be instant cessation, because Britain would have broken all international laws in doing that. I thought I'd leave you with that interesting thought today. Um, I'm 60 today, and I've been hoping for many years that I'm going to see independence before I finally disappear off this planet. But I think I'm going to see it. And the more I see of this document, the more I'm convinced of it. This is a document which sets out the actual legal position. So Nicola Sturgeon has lots of choices here. And there is nothing to stop the SNP and Green Alliance government from going straight ahead with the referendum as soon as possible, whenever it can be held, and launching a major campaign to support independence. The time is now. The time is just coming now. Just before COP26 is the time for these announcements to be made. There's never going to be a better time to do this. England as Britain has never been in a weaker state. It has weakened itself with its own stupidity through Brexit. And to be honest with you, the Brexit bounce that we didn't see because of the COVID uh, issue, which clouded the whole occasion and basically put everything into suspended animation, that's gone now. So now that the, the mists of COVID have parted, we can see the reality and we have a second chance to do this now. But we have a short window in which to make it work. And I think that window is to announce all of this, that there will be a referendum and that if the result is a yes vote, that we will open trade negotiations immediately with the European Union, whether or not the British state accepts the result. And let's just get on with it. It's about time we did this. And I can't think of a better time than just before COP26, when we can steal all the headlines, when the rest of the world is focused laser-like on Glasgow, just before that kicks off, for us to announce that we're going to do this would basically spread across the world like wildfire. Anyway, that's it for me today. I thought I'd leave you on an optimistic note today. Thank you for all the birthday wishes, incidentally. Um, you're very kind. And uh, I look forward to seeing you again tomorrow. Bye-bye for now.